This episode has been sponsored by Connor Insurance, an auto owner's insurance company. Hi, this is Abby at Connor Insurance. There have been record amounts of rain all across the country this year. Most damage occurs when water backs up in your drains and basement fixtures. If you have a basement, you need to check the limit your policy provides for water backup. If you aren't sure how to check, just give me a call or visit us at connorins.com. Shepherd has been serving the children of Indianapolis and helping families for 34 years. We work to break the cycle of poverty on the near east side of Indianapolis because we love the children in our neighborhood. We are privileged to watch our neighbors grow physically, emotionally, spiritually, and academically through the relationships we build every day. Partnered with Shepherd by donating $34 to celebrate 34 years. Visit shepherdcommunity.org slash BLF to join us. And now the show that bridges the gap between faith and business. Welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Hello, everyone. This is Ray Hilbert. I am your host here at Bottom Line Faith, and this is the program where we get the amazing opportunity to go around the country, sometimes physically traveling around the country, other times uh, on the phone, online, and so forth. And today I'm conducting an interview from our headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Truth at Work World Headquarters. It's massive. You ought to stop by sometime. That's a joke, folks. But I am your host, Ray Hilbert, and our tagline here at Bottom Line Faith is eternal business, real life. And what we're about here, if you're a regular listener, you know this already, but if you're first time joining us, thanks for coming along for the ride. But what we do is we interview amazing Christ followers who are in business leadership in various capacities around the country. We hear their stories, we hear their victories, their challenges, how their faith has shaped their journey in business and in leadership as well. And I've got to tell you, I'm really, really excited to have sitting across the desk from me someone who's become like a real inspiration and a friend over the last few months, Liesl Murtis, who is the founder. I love this. You guys are going to love this conversation today. Check this out, gang. She's the founder of Handle with Care. And Liesl is a workplace empathy consultant. And I'll bet you've never heard that term before. And buckle up, because you are going to get a great education today, and you are going to be encouraged. Lisa, welcome to Bottom Line Faith. Thanks for having me, Ray. You and I met a few months ago. We were at an event, and uh, we got a chance to connect and get to know one another, and you shared a little bit about yourself. We're going to get into your story and your background, but what's the first 20 to 30 seconds of what you would want our audience to know about you? And then we're going to dive in, but like, give us the 20 or 30 second. Hi, I'm Lisa, and... I'm a workplace empathy consultant, and so I come alongside your business to help you and your managers with those moments where you're confronted with a disruptive life event that somebody's going through. Those things like a death, a divorce, a diagnosis that oftentimes I find for managers or HR directors, it leaves them feeling totally overwhelmed and under-equipped. They don't know what to do, they don't know what to say, and their response really matters. So I help teach people and help them do those encounters better. Okay. We're going to dive. We're going to take a deep dive today. Okay. As I hear you talk about, um, I know your story and we're going to get into that, but just the phrase or the title, if you will, workplace empathy consultant. I'm reminded of 20 years ago for the first time I heard the term life coach, Mm -hmm. right? So is this term workplace empathy consultant, is it an industry? Is it something that you've kind of coined the phrase or where did that come from? So I think that workplace empathy is going to be one of the most impactful trends in HR. In the next two to five years um, for companies that are really leading their space, that are wanting to attract and retain the best talent, this is very much going to be on the forefront of people's minds. I somewhat coined the phrase, but you can see the percolating within the market, whether that's the ascendancy of Brene Brown and her focus on being brave and courageous leadership, or just the awareness of a younger generation that is so much more cognizant of bringing their whole self to the office, that these old divides that we had of this is your personal life and this is your work life and you know you just need to keep your personal life over there. Um, are really becoming a lot fuzzier. 
and especially people are starting to put data points around this. Mm -hmm. So there's the 2019 Empathy at Work survey in which 82% of respondents said that they would be willing to switch jobs for increased empathy. And 78% of respondents said that they would work longer hours for a more empathetic workplace. So the trends are really dictating um, this sort of a service as well. I, I didn't know about that. So that's very fascinating to me. So what do you mean? I think I could guess, but I want to hear from you. This is really your specialty and area of expertise. What do you mean by an empathetic workplace? First and foremost, an empathetic workplace is about seeing people as more than just what they produce when they're within your walls. It's this awareness of we're holistic people when we come to work. And specifically, a lot of what I do around training about empathy in the workplace has to do with supporting people when it matters most, which is when they go through really hard stuff, whether that's talking on a meta level about the challenges of something like COVID-19 or situationally talking about the challenges facing a workforce that's going through a reduction in force where mm -hmm. they're having to lay off a lot of people and then dealing with turnover contagion to the very personal level of people who are going through, you know, an aging parent who's just fallen and broken a hip. It's giving support both verbally and relationally, but also putting together an organizational plan where you're able to consistently demonstrate support. Because the stuff that means the most to people, they're not high cost or high touch gestures, but so often in business, we're just putting out fires. We're dealing with them sporadically. We're leaning on the personality of a given manager who's really good with people and trying to hedge around all of our people who are bad. And we see empathy as this fixed quantity, like you're either empathetic or you're not instead of a skill and capacity that can be grown and taught. So it actually can be taught. It can actually been acquired as a skill. Is that what you're telling me? Absolutely. Uh, you're going to hopefully help me understand how I can get better at that later. Can we get there? Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Lisa, I think it would be really, really critical for our audience to understand kind of the origins in your own life, why this is so personal, why this is so powerful. You've got a story. You've got something that you've been through that was foundational here. What would you like to share about that? Yeah, well, the seeds of this work were really planted um, in 2010 when I had just said yes to a graduate MBA program at the Kelly School of Business. And it was a week after I said yes that I found out that I was unexpectedly pregnant with our third child. Um, but I thought, that's okay. I can... I can do graduate school and have a baby and swing it all. And it was partway through my first semester when we found out that the little girl I was carrying, a girl named Mercy Joan, had a pretty profound birth defect. Um, it was a neural tube defect. It happens early on in pregnancy. But the base of her skull had not closed. It was a condition called an encephalocele. And what it meant was she had this large fluid-filled sac on the back of her skull. And we could see it, you know, growing with each visit that we had up in Indianapolis to maternal fetal medicine. We were traveling from Bloomington. Um, we're meeting with specialists from hospice care to neurologists. And what we were told was we really won't know the severity of her condition until we get an outside the womb MRI. We just, we can't tell enough from the imaging that we're getting. This could be operable. This could be terminal, and you need to be prepared for a range of possibilities. Um, so on February 15th, 2011, Mercy was born. Um, she was this beautiful little girl. Um, she looked like me in profile. And it was really clear from that outside the womb MRI that anything that we did would be doing things to her and not for her. There wasn't any surgical intervention um, that could correct the severity of her condition. She had a hollow spinal column. Um, she lacked connectivity between the spheres of her brain. And so she lived for eight days um, and then died. She died. We were able to bring her home to my parents' home for the last day and a half of her life. Um, and it's this searing thing. It's, it's horrible. It's formative in my faith journey. There's all sorts of questions about God and purpose and just the pressures of still caring for two small children. Um, 
my Ada and Magnus, who were her older siblings, who were three and 17 months at the time. And then there's also the reality that I'm going back to a graduate program. Mercy happened to be born at the beginning of our two-week spring break. And so I'm stepping back into this program, um, and some people knew about my condition. There were many people that didn't. They just knew me as, you know, the pregnant first-year student who looked as though I just delivered a baby. Um, So I experienced a range of responses from people who supported me so well and were able to give me faith in my capacity to continue on in the program and be able to thrive to people who I'm sure to this day they have no idea how profoundly they missed me in missing me. Um, And that seed of personal experience grew um, in conversations over the years as I was talking with other people who have gone through disruptive life events. When you have something hard happen, you can kind of become a collector of stories. Um, Fast forward a little bit, my youngest son, Moses, who is now five and a half, he was born with a condition unrelated to what Mercy had. He has a congenital heart defect, so he's needed open heart surgery and has an artificial valve from Riley. So we've had a different but not dissimilar journey with him. And that was, again, stepping into the world of how much support I needed, Mm. people who did it well, people who did it poorly. And about two years ago, I started really more purposefully talking with managers and HR leaders because dwelling in the reality of the fact that we spend more waking hours at work than we do at home and thinking, wow, support from a workplace or lack of support actually makes a really profound difference in how people go through these things, which has only been reinforced also in my work as a podcast host where I talk with people who have gone through disruptive life events and they share their stories and how they were met and how they were missed. And so that is some of the inspiring context. Thank you for that. And I want, I do want to come back and talk more about your podcast in just a moment. Sure. And I'd like to go back though, to that season when um, you've just lost your daughter, you're back in school. Mm-hmm. I think I caught that right. And you said some folks were like there and really ministered to and got but some missed Right. Some missed out or missed you or missed what. Tell us more about that. Tell us more about what maybe some of the mistakes that maybe they didn't even know. Right. Because that may help us as leaders when there are people in our organization that has this disruptive, whatever it is. What are some of those cues, some of those behavior statements? Just walk us through some of that. I'll start with the framing of some of the things that I was going through at the time internally. And then, because I think some of the messaging also relates to how a person in crisis is processing things. And if you haven't gone through something similar, having that window is a little bit helpful. So um, I'm a I'm a person with a high capacity to take things on. I'm used to doing things easily and excellently. And what I found in the aftermath of having Mercy die was I was physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually exhausted. Grief for me took such a profound toll that the things that I used to absorb easily and with a great deal of joy just felt so tiring. Whether that was my parenting, you'd think that after having a child die, you'd be, oh, you'd be so profoundly grateful and warm towards your living children. And I just found myself so tired not even wanting to be with them. I was easily annoyed by them. Um, In class, conversations that had seemed so engaging and dynamic, I brought so little attention to. I found myself thinking, why are we even discussing this? This is pointless. I don't want to do a case study on Ben and Jerry's. So everything that had come so easily felt profoundly hard because I was sad and I was exhausted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So things that mattered to support me in that were some faculty members that were able to come alongside and say, I know that this is a really hard season for you, but we want to let you know that we're here for you and we're going to help you in any way we can. Do you need extensions on your papers or just that sense of there was space to not be performing excellently? I can also remember how meaningful it felt 
when I was doing things well, when I was contributing well to a conversation or when I was selected to present our case during a case competition, how much that meant to me that although people knew I was compromised, they still saw that I could perform Mm. well and they showed that faith in my capacity. That's something that Sheryl Sandberg talks about in her book, Option B. She talks about she's the COO of Facebook. She talked about how after her husband dropped dead unexpectedly on a treadmill, she was questioning her own capacity and her ability to engage. And the coworkers that came alongside and said, you know, Cheryl, we still think that you're really good at your work, mm-hmm. gave her a belief in her own capacity. There were also just the physical manifestations. A number of my classmates from my cohort showed up at Mercy's funeral. This was during their spring break. Wow. I don't even know how those details were made known to them. Mm. They came and showed up. And I'll never forget Gail, who she was head of student services at IU. And she came up to Indianapolis to the NICU to see me. She brought with her a handwritten note from the dean of the school and a gift. She just cried with me. Wow. Um, And also had the insight to be able to say, Lisa, I don't know if you'd want this. But do you think you'd like me to go and tell all of your professors, you know, for the next semester what has happened, just so you're not having to individually explain it? So she checked in with me. She didn't just do that on my behalf. But even as she said that, I thought, absolutely, yes, I do (laughs) what you, I didn't even know I wanted that. I want that so much. Um, So that's the positive side. Yeah, yeah. On the negative side, one of the things that, can be really hard for people going through disruption is when they feel like they have to manage other people's emotional responses. Um, Mm. So I appreciated people that were sad for me, but there's this funny dynamic that can happen where suddenly you find yourself in the position of having to comfort them. So a dynamic would be, you had your baby. And I would say, I did have my baby, but she died and then the other person is going that's so sad I've just never heard something so sad oh I'm so heartbroken you know and this kind of over the top where you find yourself needing to then give comfort to them like well it'll I hope you'll be okay or we also talk about common missteps that people make as I'm in training sessions Uh, any statement that begins with things like at least you know, at least she's in a better place, or at least yeah, yeah. you can have other children. Yeah. And as a final note, I think that there is a particular pitfall that people of faith need to be aware of in that absolutely God with me as a comforting Holy Spirit and his care for me as a father was foundationally grounding to me. Um, and it was deeply important. Scripture and being in the word, but there's a way that we can talk about God's presence in the midst of hard times that mm. makes it just kind of seem like a, a foregone conclusion, like, well, she's she's in a better place, and God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and those things are true, but when they're <laughs> delivered in kind of an offhand, non-contextualized manner, they just feel so discordant um, to the lived experience. So And shallow and, and yeah. Yeah, all that, right? So um, thank you for giving us the story, the backdrop, the backdrop, and the context. So just for a moment, let's say somebody's listening to the program right now, and I want to I want to address this question from two angles. And they've just gone through, or they are going through a disruptive event, you know, a, a, a death, a divorce, a financial crisis, whatever the case may be, cancer, whatever, health issue. What advice would you have for them? in helping them communicate appropriately with their coworkers, with their supervisor? How can they properly set the, the tone and the context for the workplace environment if they're going through the disruptive event? First off, for those listeners, I'm sorry that you're having to go through something hard. Um, it's difficult. My... Advice is not going to be a one-size-fits-all because there's a difference in experiencing a disruptive life event in a company that 
is proactively thinking about employee wellness and care and actualizing their values versus a place where they really are just wanting you to clock in and clock out. And so some of the strategies that um, would be employed would be different. And with the, with the context that it's always hard when it's the affected person who's having to communicate their experience, it's a little bit like uh, a person in a minority culture who are saying, well, like, can't you just instruct us as the majority powerful people in all the ways that we can be better? I mean, it puts an added challenge uh, on a person who's already experiencing something hard. So I think one of the most important ways of addressing care in the workplace is talking about the employer and the manager side and how they can proactively do things because they're the person who's not in the thick of feeling like their world is falling apart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But for the person who is in the midst of it. One, if you are a part of a toxic culture where you know that, man, all my manager or all my CEO cares about is me um, putting in time and checking the clock. If you have the opportunity to reconsider things and leave, maybe this is a moment to do that. Um, I say that with a man in mind who's an old friend of mine, and he was part of one of these cultures. He, 30 years ago, was doing pharmaceutical sales, and his son had the same heart condition that Moses had, but it was 30 years ago, so it was way more precarious. He's having to come down from Wisconsin to Indianapolis all the time, and he knew that his workplace culture, he said, I knew if I said anything, it would only be held against me. It would mm. be the reason why I didn't get a raise. It would, everything would run through that. And he said, so I knew I just had to keep it quiet. I couldn't tell anybody. And he did. He didn't let his supervisors know. He didn't know, let them know the tremendous stress of travel and right. logistics. And, you know, he kept his numbers up, but he torched his marriage and, you know, really damaged his health. And still, a number of years later, remembers that sort of a culture. So... You might feel a little bit without options, and you might not be wrong. If you are in a culture that's in the middle, uh, or it's a place where really the values on your wall are things like, we're a family, and we want to promote your thriving, and we care about wellness, then I would suggest going first to your manager, if you have a relationship of open communication, or to your HR representative, and being able to say, this is what I'm going through, and being pointed towards accommodations within your company policies, um, whether that is bereavement leave or EAPs. But if you're in a space where you feel like you can give voice to what you're going through, yeah, um, yeah. to be able to do that. And yeah, if you're a manager or an employer listening to this, there are all kinds of things that I would suggest to you because you actually do want to be able to be that space yeah. where employees feel like they can come and bring those things forward. Having a culture of hiding or just persevering through it might pay off in short-term gains, but it's not going to be good for your culture overall. Okay, that's that's very helpful. And, and in a moment, I want to get into maybe some practical ways that you come in and help mm -hmm. companies and managers and leaders work together. But could, could you, I was told years ago, and I've tried to keep this in mind, some days I'm forgetful that every person on the planet throughout every aspect of their life is going through some sort of crisis, financial, relational, health, something, right? So talk to us a little bit about the difference between a true, and I know this is a gray area I'm going to do, a truly disruptive situation versus just life, because we, we all have stuff, right? I mean, the mm -hmm. kids get sick, and we, you know, the, the furnace breaks at home, so... Help us understand the, the real difference, the traits, the characteristics, the signs. What are we looking for between a really, as you've described, disruptive event mm. versus just life's just kind of happening? You understand what I'm asking? Let me clarify the question. Yeah. Would that be an important question as you're an employer trying to gauge whether an individual really needs that kind of care or if you're an individual trying to know whether you're in the midst of it. Would what you, sort of a perspective are you coming at it from? Would you be open to answering both of those? Sure. Which one would you like me to start All with? Right. <laughs> Who 
Who's interviewing yeah. you here? Well, because I think it's it's the the nuanced answer yeah. Yeah, is a little good. one one question comes from a position of yeah. if I open the door to this, am I setting myself up to be taken advantage of? Yes. Okay. And what is my line of differentiation? The other perspective has to do with some soul searching and how and why you ask for help. Okay. And I feel like that Fair is enough. a little bit different. So then let's start from I'm the individual and stuff is happening. Help me to discern what you would describe as a truly disruptive event versus inconvenience versus just difficulty, I guess. Start with me as the individual first. There's some personality differences that nuance that conversation because whether you use the language of Enneagram or DISC assessment or really just your sense of yourself, there are some individuals that are hardwired to push through difficult things. They get a tremendous sense of self out of that. They have gotten a lot of external accolades. Um, I would be one of those people. I can, I can remember even when pregnant with Mercy, I'm in the midst of this incredibly intense first semester where they just pound you in an MBA program. I've got this complicated, pre- I'm under a ton of stress. And what I found myself doing after I'd gotten to the end of a finals week, and I'm like seven months pregnant at this point, and I've barely slept during finals week because I've been cramming for finance exams. What felt incredibly important to me was to go run five and a half miles on a treadmill as soon as I finished my last final. And I look at that now, and I see that as so warped and compulsive. Like, what was it in my makeup that thought, I need to prove something to myself about how hard I can push by, like my body still remembers every step of that (laughs) run because it was trauma. It wasn't something I felt at the time, like this was this great capacity in me to be celebrated. But there's an element where like, just especially talking to people of faith, our areas of strength are also something that like the enemy wants to twist into dysfunction. Yeah. So there could be people listening right now, and they're actually in the midst of something super hard, but they are hardwired to think, I'm just going to keep pushing through this. I don't need help. I don't want help. I can keep managing it on my own. To those people, I would say take stock of that tendency in yourself. Like ask yourself if that's true about you. If you don't know, ask people who know and love you what they would say about that. Um, There's also this beautiful thing about how God made us as embodied holistic people, that your body will keep the score of your stress. And even if you think, if you think, I'm doing fine, this is no big deal, this is not a disruptive life event, one one of the biggest truth tellers is your body. How are you sleeping? What is your energy level like? Do you find yourself in compulsive behaviors eating patterns, exercise patterns, those will cue you in to knowing if you're in the midst of disruption where you need some rest and some particular attunement. You need to be thinking about asking for help. So for that type of personality, I do a check there. Now, there are other personality types that they are naturally not as hard driving and they are more receptive and empathetic. And the thing that that Hard driving personality type is going to just push through, really will lay this more responsive person low. And I think for those people, there's also a check of maybe you've been labeled. I I can think of a client who her whole life she's been labeled, oh, you're so sensitive. You're just so sensitive. Mm -hmm. Um, That can be its own way of steering you away from getting help because you can think, oh man, people already think that I just get bowled over so easily and I'm so sensitive and I just need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I would say you also need to respect that tendency in yourself. There's not, there are things that guaranteed they're going, you have a child die. That's going to be hard regardless of personality type. Yeah. Your spouse or partner gets a cancer diagnosis. That's going to be hard. Um, And The whole range of personality types actually does need community and care. Yeah. But people will wear it differently. Even what they might want is different. They might want to not talk about it. They might want a note or a call. And we go through decision trees and being able to be attuned to people. Even the, the person who's incredibly extroverted in the midst of disruption, 
they might become very introverted. There's not a predictive algorithm that says exactly how someone should respond. Okay. So is is a is kind of a an observation in, uh, now on the employer side, right? To to really help discern is this person going through and maybe they haven't come to me yet. Maybe they haven't talked about it to, with anybody yet. What are some of those observable signs or tendencies or traits that might give us a clue that they're going through a life disruptive event as opposed to, you know, just just the inconveniences of life? Right. That's a good question. And first off, I would say what you want to be thinking about is creating a culture where people actually believe that you can offer support that matters so they want to come forward with their disruptive life events, where it's not a culture where they think they'll be shamed, where even you as a member of the leadership team have said, I've gone through disruption in my life and I needed help and support and you've created that sort of safe space. But behavioral signs that you should look for, if you have someone who their performance has suddenly taken um, a dramatic turn over the course of some weeks or a month, those, those kinds of things that if you're an in-touch manager, you think they are just not themselves, whether that comes out in their numbers or in their presence in the office. That's another thing. If there is someone who is acting in ways that are markedly irritable or withdrawn, mm-hmm. you know, I can think of someone I've talked to recently. They were talking about when their son was going through an opioid addiction, and they were just trying to keep it under wraps all the time. But he describes how he became more and more withdrawn, irritable. He said, I'm sure that the people I worked with just started to think like, he's really a jerk. Mm -hmm, I mean, and he mm -hmm. hadn't previously been acting that way. So if you're starting to see those changes and you don't really have a context to put them in, um, someone who's normally very prompt in their responses, they're suddenly not responding to emails or texts in a timely fashion. Those are all things that a wise manager and a responsive organization don't just chalk up to, man, they were a really great employee and now they're not. Mm. It's it's almost like a detective saying, these are clues that need to lead me to ask some deeper questions. Okay, that's helpful. So is there is there a difference between a disruptive life event and a crisis? Or are we could we use those terms interchangeably? Or how, what would you say about that? Possibly you could. Okay. I don't know if semantics are the most important things. Crisis is usually... Sometimes crises are things to be fixed or an action plan to be put into place. Disruption is something that happens um, to be helped. So I don't know. Does the distinction feel important to you one way or another? I don't know. I've never actually thought about it till having this conversation with you. Like we've got the, you could talk about the corona crisis. Yeah. You also could talk about the disruption that COVID-19 is causing. Yeah. In people's individual lives, as Avon school systems here in Indianapolis have just closed for weeks at a time, like that's a substantial disruption in the life of an employee and therefore in the life of your organization. Uh, probably not an applicable uh, example, but years ago I heard the difference between a, 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 a depression and a recession. Mm-hmm. Is a recession is when your neighbor loses their job. A depression is when you lose yours. Exactly. So maybe there's something there. <laughs> so an interesting thing that I was thinking, you bring up the term crisis. Um, perhaps you've heard this. So in Chinese, the character that actually denotes crisis is made up of two letters. And one letter signifies danger and the other signifies opportunity. And so... When I do consulting around terms like crisis, and even I think it applies to disruptive life events, there is an element of danger that companies feel like, oh my gosh, this thing has happened to my top salesperson. How is this going to affect my numbers? How is this going to affect my performance? And those are not unreal dangers. Like there's a potential danger to it. Yeah. It's also a moment of tremendous opportunity to demonstrate the sort of culture you want to be. I mean, how this sort of support comes out in attraction and retention and who knows where the labor market will be in the next six months based on world account. But right now, companies really are 
in a war to retain talent. Mm-hmm. And you can you can put in a ping pong table, you can offer unlimited PTO, but really what it is to show up when somebody feels like the rest of the world is falling apart and yeah. to say, that might be happening, but here we are a stable place where you are seen and cared for. It's hard to put a price tag on that. I love that. And, and, and even as you're sharing, you know, that danger and opportunity analogy, I love that. Um, as we're recording this, the, the world's turned upside down by the coronavirus, and we, we're still learning. We don't know the ultimate impact of this, what's truth, what's not truth, and all that. However, as followers of Christ, while the world is in crisis, we have an opportunity, right, to demonstrate his peace, his assurance, his confidence. Is that kind of what you're trying to help companies understand, is that while there's this danger, mm-hmm. there is this kind of opportunity? I'm, I'm putting that in spiritual yeah. terms, but you're doing it with employers. Yeah. Well, let me take an example from past Christians in time of plague and crisis and then extrapolate to what I'm saying to employers. Okay. So even as you talk about the church's response and who we as people of faith are, if you think back historically to times like the Black Plague, mm. I mean, these were times where actually everybody fled those cities. And absolutely, did they have a reason to? I mean, it was like one in every three people died. This was tremendous. It was terrifying. And the inspirational stories that we have in history of the people who stayed, and they, I mean, they were, they were the nuns. They were, they were these people of faith who said, the imperative here is to love people because this is where Jesus would have been. It's so beautiful. And I hope coronavirus doesn't even fractionally compare to that. But whether it's talking in the reality of an actual event of contagion or into these difficult places where in some ways it makes, you know, they're they're messy potentially and they take up your bandwidth and yeah, yeah. it can be a little bit complicated. And let me say, there's a whole rationale outside of faith where I would say it is important for your bottom line. It makes sense and that your long-term attraction yeah. and retention, like there is a business rationale but especially for people who are listening, if you are people who follow the incarnate and risen Jesus, it is the most, the incarnation is one of the most profound acts of empathy ever. Like we serve an empathetic God who did not despise us in our weakness, but came to share in it. Um, And that's profound. And And loves us through it. It should impact it and (laughs) loves us through it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to, in the remaining moments, two two things. I want to learn more quickly about the range of services mm-hmm. that you offer through your firm, Handle With Care. And then I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you to give me some advice and our listeners some advice. So walk us through when a company learns about you or you get a chance to go out and share, what types of services, what does that look like? Is it one-on-one? Is it group coaching? Is it workshops, books? What's this look like and how you're helping firms create this kind of environment? It's a great question. So a good place to start is I have an introductory keynote, which helps people who say this is really evocative. We want to get some basic actionable skills. We want to know how this is affecting our bottom line. I introduce um, some common organizational and personal roadblocks to empathy And then we end with some really actionable tips that you can put into place to help transform your workplace, even right after you come out of the doors of the workshop. So that is a great place to start. I offer further manager and HR-specific equipping uh, sessions around these four main categories of disruptive life events. So that would be the first category is a death. The second is a disruptive diagnosis. The third is a relationship transition, which is purposefully broad to encompass how your workforce is forming and dissolving their intimate partnerships. It's a lot more than just single, married, or divorced. And the final category is circumstances around bringing a child into the home. So that is returning to work postpartum for men and women, adoption, IVF, and miscarriage. And those are great times to have knowledge sharing among the managers. Uh, Oftentimes these are things people are just doing within their given department. So it allows for best practices to be shared. We also, at that point in time, 
look at your policies and come up with an organizational roadmap and how to all be on the same page moving forward. I take some of those trainings. Uh, I'm offering in May and October of this year a one-day SHRM certified uh, workplace empathy certification conference. We're doing those in Indianapolis, hopefully also in Chicago this fall. And so that's a great place just for HR practitioners to come together from different companies. I also do communication coaching around downsizing. I hope that that is a reality facing none of you as listeners, but if it is, the importance of clearly and cohesively communicating across your executive team is super important. Um, It is amazing how many times in those coaching sessions everyone thinks they're on the same page Mm. and they are not. (laughs) So I help coach people in preparation. I also help coach to prevent turnover contagion because after you've laid people off, you really want the people who are remaining to remain, but they've just gone through a workplace trauma. They're facing more work, same pay, and maybe they've lost their best friend. And how do you help retain those people? Uh, The final thing I've been doing recently is communication and leadership coaching for the coronavirus. Um, The best time to have a plan was yesterday. The second best time is today. And I'm working with companies to make sure that their communication and their planning is fast, it's flexible, it's factual, and to help get on the same page with their response team. Extraordinary. A a very good depth and breadth of services. Uh, So one of the questions I asked earlier was like, you know, the term workplace empathy consultant, and you've kind of you're creating some space here. Is this a growing industry or are you kind of like an anomaly? Are you kind of like this lone wolf out there creating this? Or is this something that we're seeing across the country? This is a leading edge offering. Yeah, You are seeing books being written. You're seeing people beginning to speak around it, but I'm, we are in an exciting time of being in the midst of category creation. Yeah. Nobody really has a line item for this yet. Mm -hmm. Um, For those that are listening, I oftentimes fit under a leadership development uh, section of training. I just help make your managers better. Workplace empathy can fit under wellness. This is about holistic care for your people. It can also fit under diversity and inclusion right now. I'm speaking at some conferences this year because when people go through something hard, it makes them feel profoundly isolated. And, um, but yes, talk to me in a couple of years. And the companies who are trendsetters and pace setters will know workplace empathy as a category, I'm well, sure. Well, I love that. And, and Lisa, I've, I've somewhat lived through this in my own career because 22 years ago when we started Truth at Work, there were no conferences. There were hardly any books, any resources. There was this phrase out here, you know, business's mission we heard. We heard workplace ministry but there really was not much available. And now it's kind of a mainstream thing. And so that's what I foresee here, that you're on the front end, Blue Ocean Strategy, Mm -hmm. right? That's all out in front of you. And you're you're, you're a leading edge uh, provider there. And that's incredible. So how would our listeners connect with you, learn more, get involved, you know, maybe bring you in? What's that look like? Thanks for asking. Um, My podcast can be found it's the handle with care empathy at work podcast that can be found on apple podcast google play spotify that's a great place to start to just get a sense of what this work can sound like it's also free i have managers who listen with their teams and then discuss as to contacting me directly leaselmurtis.com is my website that's l i e s e l M-E-R-T is in truck, E-S dot com. My company is Handle with Care Consulting. Uh, my email is also liesel at lieselmurtis.com. And I would love for you to reach out. Well, folks, as you're, as you're just beginning to wind down our conversation with Liesel, I, I'm, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that several of you who are listening to this right now, uh, you've got something going on either in your life, you're going through a disruptive event. I want you to reach out to Lisa. This is how God has wired her and equipped her and, and uniquely given her the skill sets to help you. Uh, a lot of our listeners here at Bottom Line Faith, you're the business owner, you're the leading executive in the company. You and I both know if we were just to sit down one-on-one, you've got team members in your organization right now 
that need help, that are going through something, and you don't know how to help them, you're not equipped to help them, and you may not, in fact, be the right or best person, someone like Liesl can come in, and I want to encourage you to, to connect and, and, and reach out to her at Liesl. Uh, Mertes, M-E-R-T-E-S. So I want to make sure we spell that yes. right. And uh, dot com. And so that's fantastic. Well, well, Lisa, gosh, this time has gone so fast. And I would be remiss if I didn't get some advice from you, yeah. but I'm going to do it in kind of the way we do it here at Bottom Line Faith. If you had a chance to sit down with the 20-year-old version of Liesl, and you could get her to listen, I won't ask you how old you are now, but we know you're older than 20, right? So if you could sit down with the 20-year-old version of you and get her to listen to you, what advice would you give her? I would talk about what every person, if they have the privilege of living long enough, will face, which is the point where you come to the end of yourself where your bag of tricks that you have <laughs> relied upon um, for your success and favor, they have run out. And whether you label that disruption or failure, um, I think especially for people who are high achievers, who are used to succeeding often and easily, nobody really sits them down to say, there's going to come a time where you're going to feel absolutely desolate and like you're not doing anything well. and how does God see you in that moment, and how do you see yourself, and how do you need to be proactively preparing for that? I mean, a deep part of my spiritual reckoning was to really sit with, I mean, when I was so sad to feel like I don't even like being with me because I am half of the mom I know I could be, mm. or the spouse that I want to be, or the student that I'm so used to being, and I don't even like being with myself because I'm so disappointing to me right now. Um, and I really had to pray wow. through that, like, God, wow. how do you see me? Like, is yeah. that your voice? And if it's not your voice, and it's not, <laughs> what do you say over me in my weakness? Like, how do you see me? Um, and I have known the gentleness and compassion of God, but I mean, I have... I have a couple of children who are effortlessly high achievers. And even as I say this, I think, what does it mean to, you know, not to hold out like you're going to fall, you're going to fail, but to say you will. And how do you need to be preparing and how you think about your self-worth now? Good stuff. That's fantastic. So, Lisa, the last question I asked, I think we're about 160-some interviews into our yeah. program now over the last three years. So our regular listeners know what I'm about to ask you, because it's always the last question. Proverbs 4.23, Solomon writes, Above all else, guard your heart, for from it flows all of life. So what I'd like you to do is kind of fill in the blank for our audience here. Um, What would be that one piece of advice that you want to pass along today? Above all else. Know that you are the beloved of God. And that what he speaks over his son, Jesus, he speaks over you, which is his great and abiding delight. And um, that, that comes out of a question that I was pondering uh, in this podcast, which we didn't come around to address. But if you would have asked me, I was thinking, what is like a life verse or orienting yeah. chapter? I yeah. love John 14 through 16 or 17, where Jesus is preparing to be crucified, and it's his high priestly prayer is how it closes out, but it's all of these promises about, like, the Father now sees you, like, you are in me, and I am in him, and we are one, and you will be doing even greater things than I did, and you're going to have trouble and persecution, but I'm with you, and that true sense of, like, I am one with Jesus, and God's delight Mm -hmm. is over me. is what I would say. I'm going to repeat that. Above all else, know that you are the beloved of Jesus. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for being on the program today. Mm-hmm. What would be the one closing thought, consideration, in addition to this piece of advice, but what do you want to leave our audience to just, hey, ponder this, think about that, or reach out to me for this? 
There's a part of me that would want to talk about the importance of workplace empathy because it is my bread and butter, and I want you to reach out to me out of that. But my one closing thought is my other grounding life verse is out of Revelation 21 and the promise that all things are being made new. And I love that, that this earth itself is being made new, and that that does actually feed back into the importance of workplace empathy and the importance of the body, because none of this is passing away. Right? So often we think about heaven as when like all of these hard things are gone, and I, I leave that for listeners. None of this is actually passing away. It is all just going to be made new. And that means that the care that we give to each other in the hard things and in our bodies, it is important work, and it is the part of God even making all things new now in preparation for the day when it is all restored. And that's a good work to be a part of, whether that's workplace empathy or just being kind to your neighbor. It's the same thing. So. Awesome. Lisa, thank you for being here today. Yeah. Folks, check her out, lieselmurtis.com. That's L-I-E-S-E-L-M-E-R-T as in Tom, E-S dot com. She is your workplace empathy consultant and the founder of Handle With Care. Check it out, gang. And I tell you, two, I, I agree with what she shared with us today. Two years from now, we're going to hear more and more about this. And you're going to remember listening to this program. And say, I remember learning about that whole idea of workplace empathy. And as followers of Christ, that's what we're called to do. We are called to minister to those who are hurting, those who are broken. And God has given us a unique platform in the marketplace. We have positions of leadership and authority and influence, and it's our chance to bring that Christ-centered workplace environment of love and empathy and compassion and understanding. And quite often, as we learn from Liesl today, it all begins through our own journey of brokenness and pain. And as the Scripture says, what the devil meant for evil, God will surely turn for good. I want to thank you for joining us today here at Bottom Line Faith. I am your host, Ray Hilbert. Check us out on all of those traditional podcast platforms out there. And uh, the best thing you can do, two things you can do to help the program. Number one, please pray that God continues to bless what we're doing here. We are seeing continuous month-after-month growth in uh, subscriber base and feedback. We've got international presence now. It's just exciting to see what God is doing, so your prayers are coveted. And secondly, Share the stinks out of this on your social media and with your friends. And, and just like listening to the conversation with Lisa today, pass that along to your friends. Pass that along to other business owners that you know they need to know about this conversation today. So until next time, I am your host, Ray Hilbert, here at Bottom Line Faith, encouraging you to live out your faith each day in the marketplace. God bless. Bottom Line Faith is brought to you by Truth at Work. If you'd like to hear about new episodes or listen to past episodes, visit us online at bottomlinefaith.org. You can also subscribe to the show through Google Play and iTunes.